Uh, first, a disclaimer. I live in Connecticut, nearly on the exact contour line of neutrality and indifference between the Red Sox and Yankee Mets, the Celtics and Nick Nets, and the Patriots and Giants Jets. Let me put it this way. I reside somewhat to the north of that line, if you get what I mean. Six things today. Just six things on showing and seeing sports data. First, surprises, accidents, rarities are not random noise. Rather, they are what are magical, wonderful, and memorable in sports. Conventional statistical modeling dumps what, what can't be explained into a pile called random error. And things that are really big and can't be explained are called outliers as if they're lying to us, as if they are the evil other. On the contrary, outliers are rarities to be explained. They are not random. They were caused. They happened in some exquisitely rare combination of events. Rarities separate the improbable from the impossible. Here are, some, here are words for the seemingly unexplainable. Surprise, accident, miracle, Adventure, inexplicable, the betting strategies of Bill Simmons. <laughs> Sports preparation, practice, prediction, strategizing, marketing sets the stage for really cool, unscripted surprises. Miracles and misadventures are what is magical, memorable, or illegal in sports. These adventures take place in an ocean of largely repeatable, understandable, and controllable sets of patterns, rhythms, and causes. That normality is surely what sports analytics is good at. But also, sports analytics can be wonderful in explaining miracles and misadventures, previously, previously known as random outliers. Doing visual detective work in a complex multivariate space with a sample size of n equals 1. Although n equals, equals 2 is better, since you never get a bigger reduction in estimated variance than when you go from n equals 1 to n equals 2. What this means practically, for example, is the idea that rational planning could work in sports management got a lot more credibility when we had two data po points, both the Oakland A's and the T and Tampa Bay, where rational planning there might be worth about $80 million of player salaries for being rational. Rarities observe, uh, deserve more after-the-fact analysis and more patient understanding. As I was walking through the exhibits in the hall, hall uh, today, I was... Uh, I was thrilled. Um, it's, it's like seeing my dreams come true. And so I think all you need to take over the world is a good promo. We'll try it with the sound here in a second. Uh, actually, if you play it again, I could do the sound. <laughs> I'm serious. In a world of talking heads, crowd shots, and plays diagrammed with a dull sharpie comes now Cognito. <laughs> the empirical empire, miracles, misadventures, analyze amazing plays explained, evidence-based sports analytics. Not for geek, not just for geeks only. All sports coming soon. A good rarity produces a sense of wonder, even among the most partisan of sports fans. For example, the six-assist triple play by the Evil Empire. Oh. 
oh, I love stuff like this. Cano to Nix to Euclid to Nix to Euclid to Overbay to Cano. Not your usual Yankee infield. <laughs> then afterwards, the very large pitcher for the Yankees, C.C. Sabathia, said while this was going on, he was pitching, he said, out there, I'm just saying, please don't let me get involved in this rundown. <laughs> or the misadventure of the year, if not the decade, the misadventure of the butt fumble. <laughs> this is an instance of the principle, low man often wins, especially if you're Vince Wilfork. And, but wins sometimes in very weird ways. <laughs> Two guys, 600 pounds of mass, both their velocity vectors headed toward Mark Sanchez. And it's not just the mass of the butt, it's also the butt's velocity. <laughs> the, the velocity squared term in the kinetic energy equation. And velocity squared is like shipping and handling. It will get you every time. Secondly, sports analytics equals better sports reporting. Sports analytics is about the sports activity itself. This is an enormous insight in a world of hype, chat boards, lawyers, and bling. Sports analytics on a good day is about the subtlety and inherent beauty of sports performance. The radical version of this idea is that sports analytics can serve as a routine reporting mechanism for most sports events and understanding sports activities. On your handout and also on the screen is a wonderful display by Megan Yeagerman. She uh, worked a lot, she worked at the New York Times for many years, uh, and she and Joe Ward did some terrific sports graphics. For years, the only thing I knew about signaling and baseball was um, cranky old guys talking about, petulantly talking about the, un, the uh, unwritten rules of baseball and how you weren't supposed to steal this and steal that and so on. And uh, here it is, that it's actually quite interesting, the, the lusciousness of uh, signaling that's going on, uh, on, well, on every pitch, every play in baseball, all explained. And so you watch the game now just a little bit differently because you know this material is going on. This also illustrates that people were doing what you're doing a long time ago. They were doing it by hand, though, and patiently drawing and doing marvelous work. And the idea in any analytical thing is don't get it original, get it right. And so pay attention to the great designs of the past. People have been trying for, for, for centuries doing what, what you're doing, and they've done some terrific work. And so have an open mind, and, and not an empty head, but an open mind about looking and, and uh, uh, celebrating uh, the excellence, because they're doing the same thing you're doing. And since it's been kind of selected by, by, by history, what you, you see, it's probably, it might well be better than what you're doing. So steal from the best. And here is some of the best contemporary reporting in sports, and it's very analytic. This is, of course, the New York Times amazing coverage of, uh, of the Olympics. Uh, here is uh, uh, Michaela Schifrin. On the, slant, uh, on, the, uh, on the downhill, and you see now this is built up, the image is built up, and notice the annotation, so the text and image are combined, and then they go through, we'll go, kind of go down the hill here with them, let's click down through this, and we can see uh, the different down path and down path, again it's annotated, and it's annotated both at the macro level, that is, you have an overview of what's going on, but also at the micro level, because you see in the next slide, they're talking about the angle of the ski just as she's going around the corner there. And so good architectures have a depth to them. They have an overview, a macro level, and they also have a micro level. And they don't achieve the micro level 
by having little pop-ups, annoying pop-ups. See, motion catches the eye. Instead, they achieve it by high resolution, just in the real world where we see at the micro level, but also the macro level. Also, what's very good about this is the Times has a, has a credit line. People's names should be on their work. Not just the corporate ones, but the people who actually did the work. People should get credit for their work. It's a sign of personal responsibility. The New York Times reports of the Olympics integrated words, still images, moving images, engineering diagrams, sound, and analytics together all at once. And this is close now to live reporting especially if there's a time zone de delay in showing the real event. Imagine now something else, re-presentations of events done analytically. Imagine a report of any sports event, five or eight key elements, key events. And so sports analytics' highest use may have been some base someday soon, but best of all, deep, rich, short re-presentations of sports events, which will indeed be a lot more interesting and fun than the event itself, especially for really big events that these days are largely about themselves, not about the intrinsic value of sports. You can also work backwards in time, taking those old videos and box scores and, and your new analytics and words and understand what went on when Boston swept the 2004 series. Are we okay now? This is good. So how good? Sports analytics are useful for the statistical ocean of data, for outliers, and misadventures for reporting, maybe even live ongoing events. And I think best of all, for representations that really show what happened in the important game events. And don't let anyone tell you that analytics is somehow reductionist and takes the joy and passion out of sports. I think it mainly takes the stupidity out of sports because you can see much more and much more deeply without all the cranky sanctimony of, of the usual comments. Here's Richard Feynman decisively on the issue of reduction and reductionism. I have a friend who's an artist and he's sometimes taken a view which I don't agree with very well. You hold up a flower and say, look how beautiful it is. And I'll agree, I think. And he says, you see, as I as an artist can see how beautiful this is, but you as a scientist, oh, take this all apart and it becomes a dull thing. And I think that he's kind of nutty. First of all, the beauty that he sees is available to other people and to me too. I believe, although I may not be quite as refined as aesthetically as he is, that I can appreciate the beauty of the flower. At the same time, I see much more about the flower than he sees. I could imagine the cells in there, the complicated actions inside, which also have a beauty. I mean, it's not just beauty at this dimension of one centimeter, there's also beauty at a smaller dimensions, The inner structure, also the processes, the fact that the colors and the flower evolved in order to attract insects to pollinate it is interesting. It means that insects can see the color. It adds a question. Does this aesthetic sense also exist in the lower forms? That are, does it, why is it aesthetic? All kinds of interesting questions which the science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower. It only adds. I don't understand how it subtracts. Wow. The third grand point. Integrate everything, all kinds of information, and never, ever segregate by the mode of production. 
The major defect of the GUI, the graphical user interface, is it does exactly that. It segregates information by its mode of production. We go to a special room to write words, a different special room to, uh, to do a spreadsheet, a different, a different special room. That's crazy. We should, in fact, have a documents-based interface. And one of the reasons that people segregate information in their displays is because they're working on an apparatus that deliberately segregates information on the displays. The most important seeing, thinking, reporting, and organizing principle in all of this is this. Integrate all the different modes of production of information. It is all information after all. Words, numbers, videos, diagrams, sock puppets, maps, tables, what have you. Furthermore, this integration should come at the content level not at the upper levels of the administrative hierarchy. Call this the bird book principle. And you have on the screen, which uh, that looks pretty good, oh, and also on your handout, a, um, a double-page spread from a field guide to birds. And look at all the different modes of information they use here, all at once, all within the common eye span. And it's all about the bird. They use sentences. They have a dynamic map for each of the four birds about where they, uh, their seasonal, uh, where their seasonal uh, locality. There's a sonogram of the song of the bird. There are probably between two and two and four hundred numbers in that little sonogram. There are silhouettes of the bird, so you can distinguish the birds being talked about from the similar. There are stills of the bird in flight that show the flight postures of the wings of the bird and also their flight formation. The scaling is done not only by saying the blue jay is 10 inches, but also by placing the birds in a context whose size we already know. That is a twig. Notice the flight postures of the scrub jay has an unusual one, so they call that out down below. And also the birds are not photographs, they are paintings, because a photograph of a blue jay would be a photograph of that particular blue jay. And so they do, bird books are done by artists who paint because they can slightly highlight the keys to the bird and make a generic, an all-purpose blue jay. I think there are seven or eight things going on in that, different modes of production, all brought together. And there's not a single piece of chart chunk there. It's all about the birds, seven modes of information. Here is how Galileo reported his discovery of the rings of Saturn. The first human eye, he built the telescope with his own hands, ground the lenses, turned it skyward, and he saw the rings of Saturn. And look how he reported it. In the second line, he says, Saturn looks like this, and there it is. And in the fourth line, he says, when the scene is a little bit difficult, it looks like that, down in the fourth line. Makes a comparison. Complete integration of words. You know, there are a lot of people who can't do this on their website even today. He did this in 1613, the image exactly embedded in the text. Okay, if it's good enough for, for Galileo, it's good enough for the Baltimore Orioles. This is a faux news story. You'll uh, recognize by the arch tone that it was written by someone who was a New England sports, a sports a snob like myself. And uh, follow with me very closely. Yesterday, the surging Baltimore Orioles won their fourth exciting game in a row. Still, the team had hardly recovered from a poor start. With a season record so far, here we go. Eight wins and 31 losses, and there is the record, the season record of 39 games. And it's pretty easy to tell that whiskers on the downside are losses, the whiskers on the upside are a win, and that this is a, this is a team that sucks. That's a technical term. I learned that at Fenway Park. I learned a number of such technical terms. I learned one, I, I learned one from David Ortiz, in fact. So. <laughs> That's one of the, his line, which I won't repeat, uh, that, since this involves a Disney production. Um, is, uh, that's one of the great lines of sports. It really is. Uh, uh, 
powerful movie. Oh, and there's a causal variable built in there. There are two causes of wins and losses, talent and whether you're playing at home or on the road. And so you've probably already spotted this, the little horizontal line in the middle are, are uh, home games, no line, are away games. And so we can now do this, same display, uh, for the only two teams in baseball that matter. Uh, you can look at the handout. We're going to get to high. Maybe the screen's okay. We're, um, we have up at the top uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, evil empire, the Yankees and, the, and Boston. And then in the display, the entire season is shown for both teams. And then, uh, so we have numbers uh, in the table. We have images, the, the little whisker lines. We have the words. And then on the left, this is something that ESPN used to do. I haven't seen it lately. The architecture of competition for the entire season. Over on the far left, they start out even. And then you're now seeing not only the, it affect the standings every day, but the distance in terms of games one lost between the teams. And so we can follow along. Uh, the reason the Yankees are in red is I put the the leading team in red, but you can follow along and you see the entanglement early in the season of the Red Sox and Yankees. They were running first and second. And then the Red Sox uh, sagged a little bit and the Yankees surged. And look at this, an incredible surge by the Reds. Oh, oh, too bad. I actually can go through this almost for every game if you'd like. To <laughs> this is a terrific graphic. Think of what you're seeing. You're seeing the standings, the entire architecture of the race, day by day, but it aggregates into the overall picture and the architecture of competition. Now, let's start extending this. If you have a good idea, small multiply it. And so now we see it for the American, the American uh, uh, League. And uh, we see the architecture of competition for all, th uh, all three divisions. And we can start maybe learning something. Uh, for example, it looks like it's all over for some teams by mid-June. Um, I'm, uh, I'm talking you, Kansas City. Uh, I'm talking you, Seattle. Or if we look at the National uh, League, uh, we can, it looks like it might be all over for some divisions, that is a runaway winner, you know, maybe by mid-July. Mid uh, look at, uh, at Atlanta, look, at, uh, look at, uh, at, at St. Louis. So we've seen uh, 5,000 numbers represented, uh, win-loss, wins, 5,000 wins and losses represented, uh, 200 uh, uh, 200 uh, numbers, and uh, let's say we want to check up on our idea when we found out uh, about uh, when we might be able to identify runaway uh, uh, losers or runaway divisions in uh, winning, and so we look at this for 10 years, and we are now looking at 50,000 win-loss outcomes, 2,400 numbers, and we're not even, we're thinking entirely about the content. There's not a single thing up there that isn't content. There are no legends, there are no little boxes, there are no drop shadows. It is pure content, just words, numbers, and images, just all completely together, perfectly natural. And anybody who can read it, you know, this is very easy, obviously, to, to, to read. The only hard part is picking up the home and away part. You might, you know, you, have, you usually have to tell people about, about that. But there's a problem of inference, of graphical inference here, particularly with regard to those whisker lines that we first saw, the, the entire season record. When we look at a data display like the whisker lines, we're making graphical inferences, just like we make statistical inferences from data in spreadsheets. These are graphic, graphical interests. And we want to be careful because these whisker lines cooperate with a major bias. Perceptual error. People oversee patterns, even in random number tables. Um, the 
Uh, there's a big streak bias. We are all probably better at believing than seeing. That's not a good combination. Over-detecting patterns, uh, believing too quickly, and under-detecting bullshit. There are various names for this. Type 1 error in statistics, that is accepting a false positive. Uh, patternicity, that cell phone in your pocket is not actually vibrating, it just feels like it. That's a type 1 error. So you accepted a false positive. Superstition, the gambling and the, gambling, the gambler's fallacy. Uh, proprietary secret sauces, that's meant to make a point, everybody. Streak bias and sports commentary. Here's the favorite cartoonist of all geeks, XKCD on this point. So we have a weighted random number gener generator producing this, uh, let's build uh, all sports commentary. Look at that. <laughs> so what to do about the overseeing of streaks? Um, Adam uh, Schwartz, a, uh, a recent MIT graduate and I have been uh, working together and uh, we built uh, a, a, a sequence randomizer for the seasons. So up on the top, uh, and this resides in the browser, it's open source, up on the top we see the actual record of the Red Sox up here. And of course when we look at that, we start looking for streaks, especially because uh, uh, any streak over four, four wins is highlighted. And then over on the right here is the, uh, the largest winning streak. And we see here on the Red Sox that uh, they had a really happy clubhouse. The guys were getting along and they were winning and then they had these problems and so on, all the stories. Now let's randomize over time and so the same win-loss record at home and on the road is maintained, so the marginals are okay. And we click a button, uh, oddly enough, called uh, uh, randomize uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the seasons. And we discover all kinds of streaks in the random sequences that look pretty much. And we challenge the analysts, let's embed the real season among the random and you tell us which one is the real season. I call this device the interocular trauma test of statistical significance because it hits you between the eyes. It's available right there for the analyst, right at that moment. You don't go through you know, an apparatus, this is graphical inference, just like statistical inference. You're trying to figure out what's going on and making inference about it, okay. So we do, we build in these little kind of local randomization devices into the data. Note again now the integration of words, numbers, graphics, randomized graphics, all on one surface because they're all testifying about the problem of graphical inference. Let's look now at um, uh, the future of, uh, this is at the highest level of visualization of uh, maps moving in time. This comes from a documentary film that I uh, produced called uh, Inga Druckery, Teaching to See. Uh, about, uh, well, it's about teaching to see. It's 37 minutes. And we're gonna see this twice. The first time we'll hear uh, Inga talking about uh, uh, high resolution design and some points about using light colors because you can make more subtle differentiations. And then we'll look at it um, um, as, the, as the future of, uh, of uh, 4K, 6K and 8K visualizations. Good survey maps integrate multiple layers of detailed information. They use color intelligently, balancing between hue, gray value, and brightness. Different types of information live together without harming each other. Detail type and symbols survive because the landscape features are kept very light. Brightness is the full saturation of a color and could be defined 
as the blue is blue or red is red. The lightest color, on the other hand, is the one closest to white. We also talk about color in terms of gray value or weight. The brightest yellow is close to a 5% gray value. The brightest blue to a 70% gray. The brightest red to about 50%. Bad maps have a dominance of bright colors and simply get noisy. Typographic details get lost in meaningless dark shading of the building. It's astonishing how sensitive our eyes are in distinguishing the most subtle variation in color. Gradual value changes are used to show variations of height or type of terrain. The color of the glacier, this typical bluish cast, is very close to reality. And so is the landscape. Even the type and symbols are layered by different size and weight to indicate their significance. If you want to play in the big leagues in visualization, put your visualization on the screen and the Swiss mountain maps next to it. That's really the big leagues. Don't try that at home. That's, this is the, the serious, this maps moving in time. Let's look at that again a little bit and, and let me talk about, uh, describe some of the characteristics of the Swiss mountain maps. They're all about content. They're high resolution. There's a vigorous expression of a third dimension. And notice how the third dimension is subtly created just by the camera panning over it. And you can see ski lifts that go over the mountains. And so you have 3D without contraptions, without glasses, without funny glasses. Local details are embedded in a larger context. Light colors avoid optical cl clutter. Content-driven colors. Great, graceful typography. The type is proportional to the size of the object labeled. The type is quantitative. Intense quantitative data by means of contour lines. In effect, we have spark lines in three dimensions now. Complete integration, words, numbers, depiction. Intense local information in position without annoying pop-ups. Zero star chunk. All the pixels are carrying content. And there's also, the real secret is great content. This would be terrible if it were for Kansas, okay? These are the Swiss Alps, you know? <laughs> Nothing would happen for 200 miles. It's open source, non-proprietary formats. It's driven by content, a spirit of public service, pride in the forever craft of cartography. It's not driven by marketplace ethics. It's not driven by focus groups. This is the real big leagues. This might be a contract spec. You know, we want to put your, what you're going to visualization you're going to build, we want to put it next to the Swiss mountain maps. That's our comparison set. That's an extreme challenge. And I think that as this happens and goes on, of course, to 4K and 6K and 8K, this is essentially the future of visualization. Or it's in effect completely integrated mappings, but moving gently in time to give you free three-dimensionality. Now, a res less rigorous test for data graphics is to use the com your comparison set is the most widely used information display in human history all over the world. And that comes uh, a true uh, once again about every week, which is Google Maps. And so you put your little stinking bar chart next to Google Maps, uh, your slide, and so on. Now, this is Google Maps is looked at by hundreds of millions of people a day all over the earth, and they're actually doing something with the data by getting somewhere, and they somehow are able to read this level of intensity of information. People haven't suddenly gotten stupid because they're looking at your stuff. 
They're just as smart as when they're looking at Google Maps and there are 80 words on that surface and they're soft colors so you can see layers and there are four layers. There's the, the big, the interstates and the main roads and then on, on down. And it's a map moving in time. We can see traffic flows uh, uh, at the morning rush hour going across the river from Arlington to, uh, to Washington. And we know it works. We can't have designers saying, well, our audience is a little stupid, you know, so we shouldn't show much data. People routinely see material like this. Or when you're walking down the hall, you're taking in 20 megabits a second of three-dimensional color information. We seem to do it all the time except when we're at work. And so anytime you do any kind of graphic, and no matter what it's for, put it next to Google Maps and ask, why can't I have words all over the things? Why do I have legends? Why do I have all this apparatus? Why can't I have three or four layers? Why don't, why don't we use more subtle colors and all of that? And so that's a direct comparison set. There are all kinds of, of principles that come with that map. And so you don't have to list them. You can just see them. That you, why doesn't my stuff look as good as Google Maps? And so this is our comparison sets, things we kn that are successful in the wild. And so it can't be claimed that somehow only sophisticated users do this. Google Maps trumps that argument because it's the most widely used data graphic in human history in all these languages every day in the world. Finally, the integration principle applies to the organization of analytics, visualization, and reporting to the world. Some of the best data analytics and visualizations in the world are found in the science journal Nature. That's because they do real science, but also because the researchers, what do they do? They do the research, the analysis, the visualization, and the reporting, all integrated together. That's why it's so coherent and so good. Similarly, the best news graphics analytical visualization in the world is at the New York Times. It is not by a design department, a graphics department, a word department, or by the crusty, turfy guys in the photo department. It is a news department. The people there often do their own content reporting, visualization, coding, and production. It is about the news, not just the old way of a few wo of words and a few photos, but rather by doing whatever it takes. Other prominent examples of these completely integrated uh, practices are Grantland, Nate Silver, and ET. The spirit is whatever it takes, flat, not hard, complete integration. Next point. Reaching conclusions about human behavior, which is what you guys are doing, is very difficult. Social science is not rocket science. It's much harder than rocket science. Real science has, an, has it easy because it has a, a gold standard, a true standard. That is, everything that they see and reason and think about and observe is a product of the universal laws of nature which apply to every single particle in the universe forever. We don't have that kind of wonderful, convenient guarantee for human beings. We make discoveries about human beings and they learn about the discoveries and they, they flip them, they reverse them. They actually can change what we think is a kind of law. Or the discovery interacts. So something works at, the, at, a, at a local level. Uh, it optimizes at the local level. And when it happens all over the, uh, uh, when at the global level, it pessimizes. Uh, think uh, models for derivatives markets. They work locally. In aggregate, they pessimize. This is very important to think about in some ways um, um, we're all doing amateur social science. One consequence of that is think there, there are people who really do social science. 
They're called social scientists. They know about all the pitfalls. They're ep or epidemiologists, or people like that. They know about all the pitfalls. In sports, losers are often blamed for their losses, often because of alleged character defects. You know, the guys are, are not getting along in the clubhouse. Uh, they're not pulling together. Well, of course they're cranky. They're losing. Just flip the causal arrow. We don't even know for sure in human beings whether exercise causes good health or good health just allows people to exercise. We don't know the direction. We don't even know the direction of the causal arrow. This is hard. Here is a veteran announcer and veteran first base coach. Uh, what making what might be called a mistake. Listen carefully. This is the St. Louis. Cardinals announcer calling the last out in the fourth game of the most recent World Series. There's so much going on here. There are two outs in the ninth. There it's, the Cardinals are behind by two runs. They have a, ma a person on first. A pinch runner, Wong, comes in. This is um, okay. his first appearance in the series. It's the first pitch. He's being held on. Oddly enough, it's a run that doesn't matter really, although an out really would matter. And then inducing Wong in a way, I think, to maybe challenge the pitcher a bit because he's being held on. That's the response. That as if he should threaten stealing, which of course he shouldn't do at all or shouldn't really steal. And so listen to this carefully uh, and what happens here in this little your Magic. first baseman nap when he holds against the runner. Why, I do not know. <laughs> Why would they be holding, John? Right. That's silly. <laughs> Here's a throw over, and he's picked off. He picked him off. That's he why. Picked. The Cardinal pinch runner Wong is picked off, and uh, Boston wins the game 4 to 2. Damn. A rookie mistake. That's and, why uh, they were holding. Uh, exactly right. The only reason they could have been holding. And uh, what Wong was doing, I have no idea. His run didn't mean anything. He's picked off, and Boston wins this game 4-2. to two. What happened is not so much a veteran announcer and a veteran coach making a mistake, or a rookie, or a rookie pinch runner making a mistake. It was just a really cool move by another team named the Red Sox. The best thing ever said by a losing manager was the other guys out there aren't exactly statues. Give some credit to performances of winners instead of being like the chat board analysts who are endlessly blaming people who have terrific records for a single bad play as if they choked and and they put you know it's character defects and there's a lot of bias in that kind of motive attribution for 15 years the only athletes who choked in the in the sports world commentary world were women tennis players nobody else did Let's see how difficult social science is. Here are some major studies of very serious things. Here is the famous Phillips curve in economics. This deals with the relationship between unemployment and inflation, the trade-off. And you see as you go, as the unemployment rate goes up, that's going to the right, the inflation goes down. Or if you ride the curve up the other way, as the unemployment rate goes down, that's good. The inflation rate goes up, that's bad. This is for 10 years, nine years in the 1960s, which was the golden age of what's called the Phillips curve. Uh, micro, uh, macroeconomists got really excited about this. We could now, they now had evidence uh, to uh, uh, provide uh, uh, sound advice for policy. Uh, the the uh, policymakers could choose where they'd like to be on this curve, on the trade-off, and they could put you there. Uh, that was 40 years ago, um, and uh, here's what happened since. 
Holy, sh look at that. <laughs> oh my goodness. There have been six Nobel Prizes in economics to try to recover. The current uh, set of theories is that there are multiple Phillips curves riding upwards, and this must work in the short run. And so if you allow multiple Phillips curves, you, it, the, uh, the model will fit any point on the two-dimensional space. Uh, that is called theology. <laughs> Let's click back and forth a little bit more on that. I just love this. Bam! <laughs> All models that are published are overfitted and they will all shrink. It's called technically shrinkage, the R squared drops. And the best, the, the, the best you will ever see a model is in a conference paper. It'll never be better than that. <laughs> because then the evidence decay cycle starts to, to click in. Um, Let's now look at a, what was a, a tremendous triumph for, oh, by the way, a lot of people lost their jobs and a lot of people stayed unemployed because of the belief by policymakers in this sacred curve. Now, a big data example, Google flu. Google flu estimated what the Centers for Disease Control would publish two and a half weeks later, so they could, uh, on the, uh, the Centers for Disease Control, observed reports from doctors and hospitals about flu symptoms, and so they would track the epidemic that way. And so Google flu would, was developed by uh, seeing what, what words people searched. And so if they searched flu shots, flu symptoms, flu, and so on, then that was a sign that they were getting the flu and they would, you know, see if somebody, and then that would wind up in the CDC data. And uh, this uh, looked pretty good for the first year or two. It had to be fixed up a little bit, the model. And uh, uh, this is data put together by uh, uh, Keith Weinstein, who's at MIT. And uh, they got the model revised and they did great. And then it blew up in 2013. So maybe about 6% uh, uh, about of uh, American households experienced flu. Uh, Google was claiming at the height of the epidemic it was 11%. It's a huge error. The model blew up. It also blew up in, uh, in the regional displays. Uh, here is the display for um, uh, New England. and. Uh, the error you see, the CDC data, the, the real data, the red, and uh, Google flu uh, got it, um, uh, missed the call by 370%. Worse than Gallup, worse than Rasmussen. Now, there are a number of reasons this happened. One of them is that uh, Google flu became part of the news, and then people started Googling flu, flu symptoms, should I get a flu shot? It, it's more news now because Google flu is saying the flu is rising. So there can, see, so these things that involve human behavior can kind of fall apart, you know, by the fact that they're also present in the world. That's not just a philosophical point, it's a real point. Uh, it's, it's thought, however, that Google has a new project, converting hubris into a renewable energy source. The most read article in medical research for the last five years, that's the kind of thing you're doing, has this title, most published research is false. There's a big dispute. What does the word most mean? Is it 80%? Maybe only 75, or is it 90%? There are also replications, 64 landmark studies in clinical oncology were subject recently to replication. Six of them replicated. These are all published studies, refereed, peer-reviewed. Six of the 64 replicated. The uh, producer of one of the original studies was interviewed about their study and said, well, they tried their experiment five times, it worked once, and they published the one time it worked. 
Why do research if you already know the desired results? How difficult it is to get it right. The PSA test for prostate cancer, the NNT is 47. The NNT is called the number needed to treat to improve the life of a single person. It should be one. You treat one, they have a better life. No, it's 47. So 47 men have an operation. Three of them die as a direct result of the surgery. Nearly all of them are mutilated. And one man's life is extended slightly. 46, it's very, very costly. That is a huge cost in lost life and lost quality and a small gain for one life. It took 40 years to figure that out in an environment over lush with attitude, money, desired results. The NNT, by the way, for a breast cancer, um, a, a, a positive mammogram followed by an operation, the NNT is 12. 11 women get, get, have no benefit or har they're harmed by it for extending the life of one. It took 40 years of a badly controlled experiment on 100 million women to discover a simple two-variable relationship which is that hormone replacement therapy uh, causes, elevates the risk of breast cancer. Social science, human science, is really hard. What to do about this? You should first decide in your research whether it's to learn the truth or it's just something to be done by a deadline or it's just a pitch study. If you need to get closer to the truth, you need to follow rigorous research protocols. That's about half of Nate Silver's secret. Do clean replications of found results. Have an assigned devil's advocate, maybe a diplomatic skeptic, shall we say, who keeps an eye. Do, do a, a, a similar study simultaneously and independently. They don't know, two groups don't know they're working on the same thing. See what they come up with. That's a pretty good test. Put the results of data out in the public. You'll find out their alternative explanation, and some ambitious graduate student will try to find contrary evidence. Well, good. Secret sauces finesse contrary inquiries. Sometimes you can design quasi-experiments. Quasi There's there been some suspiciously fast recoveries from major injuries and surgeries lately. Well, let's see, now keep an eye on sports where PEDs are closely monitored and those that are not. So Lindsay Vaughn took the usual six months for her knee. She's in a sport with fairly rigorous testing. And in other sports, they seem to be taking four months. So some information is better than less information, but that's all it's better than. These problems haven't gone away with big data. What decides the empirical outcome of a study is first its research design. Is it a randomized controlled trial? Where did the data come from? Second, the data analysis contributes to what the findings are. You know, and there are all these little tilts that can happen. How do we divide severe and moderate? How do we decide that category? What do we do with missing data? And people make those decisions kind of sort of seeing how it might affect the results. Hey, three or four tilts, and you've got a finding. It's especially true when there's been a lot of research in, in the field because findings are at a small level. They're hard to find. Three or four tilts, cheats, you've got a finding. Finally, there's the publication process. Studies that produce undesired results aren't published. Oh, yes, and also mattering to a study's outcome is the data. The research design thing is really serious. The data mining, tilting thing is really serious. Th those all produce outcomes. This is a model that, pr that, that su suggests outcomes. Next part, advice to students and similar. It sure helps to do something you enjoy, and that may m not be the thing that is convenient or that might make you rich. In analytics, your work should be rigorous and relevant. That is, the work should be consequential. And maybe the relevance should have 
you know, a little bit longer time horizon. Your probably most single most important act in your research and your career is in the choice of the problem that you work on. That will set the road. The problem should be relevant, but it also should be solvable, that you can make progress on it. It's very important that you learn how to separate out the mediocre from the excellent and then read the excellent over and over and the third time reading it maybe then get skeptical. The great thing about your skills is that they are universal and apply to many content areas. That means you have choices and opportunities. Smart people who know the relationship between evidence and inference are desperately needed everywhere. This means you should read widely about research in other fields because they're doing analytics also. Here's a story about where analytics were involved. Uh, four years ago, President Obama appointed me to the Recovery Independent Advisory Panel, and the job of the four of us was to uh, watch over uh, what was called RAPV, the Recovery Accountability Transparency Board, which was to monitor waste, fraud, and abuse and efficiency in recovery spending and also to make the recovery data transparent to the world. And I, I did some, uh, a few things on the website. Uh, my, the advisory panel as I, I, I was on that was of no consequence because we advised two geniuses, Earl Devaney, and Mike Wood, who were overseeing the, co the 100,000 contracts for $840 billion of things. And they were being paid less than probably anyone over 35 in this room. They did it for very different reasons, for public service, for working on what's you know the, maybe the most important kind of problem around. They did it so well that it looks like it will now apply to all government spending. The one part that wasn't done well is uh, the analytics were lousy. In the swag bag that I got uh, at, the, at the party, it had a book uh, that was a very careful study of uh, uh, 40 male pro golfers with incredible data, and it made our, the analytics that on the recovery, which are all out there for people to look at, and trivial. Most of the analytics uh, work was done by um, uh, people from the military who just, that's not their thing, to put it mildly. Uh, and that was the big weakness of this, that we, we that, you know, the analytics kind of never showed up from the government or from people seeing the data. It's now starting to show up in research. And my question about that is, where were you guys? Thank you very much. <laughs>